Welcome, everyone. This is our second cafe in our uh, 14th annual season of uh, archaeology cafes. As everyone's well aware, uh, we've all switched to doing pretty much everything online or uh, on Zoom. And it's an opportunity to keep ourselves uh, safe and to share this uh, preservation archaeology mission of our Archaeology Southwest staff with a really wide audience. So um, we're making the best of uh, what we've got, the hand we've been dealt this year. So, and tonight, uh, Linda and I are actually downtown in Tucson in our uh, office. And Chris Castledine, our speaker, is up in Phoenix. So we're in the traditional lands of uh, the Tana Autumn here in the Tucson area, and Chris up in the Phoenix area, the traditional lands of <clears throat> the Akimel Autumn and Pipash. So wherever you may be tonight, uh, take a minute and reflect on the fact that we all today inhabit the traditional lands of uh, native peoples and uh, think about that. Uh, aspect of our history. <clears throat> Few lo little logistics. Um, we've got the, uh, this is a sponsored event and the Smith Living Trust is the, uh, once again this year, uh, Jean Eldon and <clears throat> Jay uh, Smith uh, helping us out to put this these events on. So thank you the Smith family. So Chris is our, um, he, he's a currently a, a postdoctoral fellow here at um, Archaeology Southwest. He got his degree at uh, Arizona State University or just earlier this year, which seems like about 15 years ago, the way this year has gone. Um, but it's really less than a year. So um, the topic that Chris is going to be sharing with us tonight uh, is actually what he um, did his dissertation work on. So you'll be having an opportunity to hear about one of those most important things in the desert, water. And um, so we'll turn this uh, evening over to Chris Castledine with the flow of water and time, irrigation longe longevity and social change among the Lower Salt River, Hohokam. So Chris, uh, it's all yours. Thank you, Bill. As Bill said, I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at Archaeology Southwest. Let's see if I can get my computer to work. Bring that up. So today I'll be talking about a large portion of my dissertation research, which looked at which reconstructed irrigate Hocom irrigation along the Lower Salt River in the Phoenix Basin. And I'll give some time frames and the reconstructions over this. So to begin with, I'll give a brief overcap of the Hocom region, just so we're in the same place. This map was created by through Cyber Southwest, which is part what one of the side projects, one of the projects of a few members of. Archaeology st Southwest staff looking at both ceramics and obsidian. This map shows where uh, Sacaton right on buff and Tanky Verde right on buff have been found. And it gives a pretty good outline of the Hohokam region, which was somewhere in the ballpark of 80,000 square uh, kilometers, a um, little more than 50,000 square miles. The outline I have there is of the state of South Carolina. So it gives you a rough estimate or rough idea that the Hohokam region was a little more about the size of South Carolina. So that, that should stick in your head. It stuck in my head the first time I heard that. The Phoenix Basin doesn't have less ceramics than the Tucson and Safford Basin. It's just, that's, that's the nature of the uh, cyber Southwest right now. There's more data being put in there and this is gonna look a lot different in a year or so. So at its height, this is showing the height of the Hohokam region at about 11 or 1,100 CE. Um, this included the Phoenix Basin right here, 
the Tucson Basin, Safford Basin, and Tonto Basin, where Roosevelt Lake is now. After roughly 1100 uh, CE, this region really sunk, the Hohokam region really sunk, shrunk down into the Phoenix Basin and the Tucson Basin. There are still people living up here, and it's definitely Archaeology Southwest to talk about the, the Tonto Basin in relation to the Slotto and the Slotto phenomenon in Roosevelt Redwares and the Safford Basin, which Jeff Clark talked about the last this last cafe. For my talk, I'll be focusing on the Lower Salt River Valley, which is highlighted by green, this green area right here. It's situated within the larger Phoenix Basin, which is this entire area, which includes the Salt River, Pima, Maricopa Indian community toward the uh, right or the east side of the Lower Salt River Valley, almost going down into the Gila River Indian community. So it's a fairly large area that uh, was once irrigated by the Hohokam. It's comprised of two geologic basins, the Higley Basin and the Luke Basin. So even though it's, it's a valley, it's, it, it's formerly two basins with the Lower Salt River right here flowing through it. As you'll see, the Papago Buttes will figure importantly into my talk later on. This is Tempe Butte where ASU is or Arizona State University. You have South Mountain and the Phoenix Mountains. So roughly the, the Lower Salt River Valley is running from the Phoenix Mountains down here to Southern Chandler from west of the Verde River all the way out west to the Salt Gila Confluence. Although this area here, Phoenix Basin in general, but especially the Lower Salt River Valley became really known for Hohokam irrigation and known for irrigation throughout time and even currently today. The irrigation, if you have been to Phoenix, it's largely based off of Hohokam irrigation. The Euro-Americans or Anglo-Americans very early on just dug out old or uh, buried Hohokam canals and reused them. The so even though it's so important, irrigation so, so it was such a large thing, as I'll discuss, and uh, pretty old, it's not as old as the Phoenix Bay or as the Tucson Basin, which predates irrigation in the, the Lower Salt River Valley by uh, about a thousand plus years. We have the first evidence of irrigation in the valley at about 50 CE, and I'll get more to the history after that. To provide you with context of what the problems I was trying to solve with my dissertation and looking at reconstructing the irrigation systems, I'll begin at looking at uh, the pre-classic and then two transitions that happen. The pre-classic, um, the pre-classic for the Hohokam lasts from about 700 to 1100 slash 1150 CE. During this time, if you've ever seen Red on Buff Pottery, that, that's that's when this is occurring. This, I really like this illustration. I think it's the best that really shows pre-classic village life. You have pit houses uh, in, it, in the form of a courtyard group. So you have the pit house doors all facing toward a central courtyard. You have individuals doing different tasks. This, these individuals seem to be grinding maize. And you have other things going on here. You have uh, agave being grown up here on the hillside on these terraces. So it's a very open uh, layout uh, of the community at this time. Uh, with that, you have re regional relationships that were fostered by ball courts and marketplace systems. You can see here this ball, ball game going on in the background. You have ball players and you have spectators who are watching it. Alongside that, there appears to have been marketplaces that brought people that were not, not necessarily close kin, they probably knew each other, but it brought people that produced pottery and other items, shell, together with people that needed those things. So you, this enabled people from across the Hohokam region, from the Roosevelt Lake area, from Tucson, from Safford, and everywhere else within the region to kind of come to one place and get their red on buff pottery, which was being made along the lower or the middle Gila River and other items that wasn't locally available to them. So the analogy I'd like to give for this is the ball court and marketplace system are like an NBA basketball game surrounded by a swap meet.
during the pre-classic classic transition from approximately 1070 to 1100 slash 1150 CE, you see a major shift, a major turning away from the pre-classic. One notable change is a shift in domestic architecture from pit houses, which are illustrated here. This image is from an area of Casa Grande Ruins National Monument. And it gives a really good example of the transition going on between the sedentary period or the pre-classic and the classic period. So you have earlier pit houses, which they're below this, there's a post-reinforced adobe structure here. And then later on, these solid walled adobe structures without posts are built. So there seems to be, these are going on at the same time these are eventually going to replace all the other types of architecture. Toward As we get closer to AD 1300, which I'll discuss next, you start seeing walls being used predominantly around both residents and other areas. Corresponding with the transition, you see a real fragmentation of social relationships, which has also been called the social balkanization of the Hokong. This map right here shows a number of the irrigation systems during the late or the early classic period along the lower Salt River. These, do, da, these dotted lines or dashed lines indicate that there was a severing of the re relationships that were formerly fostered by these ball games and marketplaces. So essentially, it looked like these irrigation systems were worlds on themselves. People were probably interacting with each other. But based off of ceramic uh, exchange studies by Dave Abbott and others, it appears that people no longer exchange pottery across the different irrigation systems, especially Canal System 2 and elsewhere, and within the, the larger region. This is why I said at the very beginning that the Hohokam region shrinks down after 1100 CE. At about 1300 CE, you have the beginning of the Savano, and that was a complete change or a, a major change from even the pre classic classic transition. You see compound architecture completely take over as a dominant architectural form, not only for houses and where people lived, but also ceremonial areas like platform mounds, which I'll show next. You can kind of see here you have. This wall, this is Los Mortos Compound 2 that was excavated by the Hemingway Expedition in the late 1880s. So you have a wall around this kind of open, unexcavated area. You have all these rooms. Even though these rooms are ordered by a wall and they look much more blocky, they do seem to retain some kind of uh, courtyard group arrangement where you have openings facing a central area that people kind of can use you'll get matates and other things within here. So even though there's a lot more walls and a lot more barriers for walking in between different areas and even entering the compound itself, the basic design of how the Hohokam are organizing their residential areas seems to persist through time. Corresponding with this, you see at least along the Lower Sol and the Phoenix Basin, a uniformality or all the platform mounds in the area seem to assume a square or rectangular or I should say a rectangular shape. You can see this artist rendition of Pueblo Grande. You have a compound wall here. So again, you're separating the public space from the private space or ritual space from other spaces. Same thing with the compounds. And then you have the platform mound here, Pueblo Grande's mound. And people are doing things on top of the mound. No longer can people just walk up here and see what's going on in this courtyard on top of the platform mound, as you could with ball courts. So there seems to be a real shift from kind of an open society where people could go where they wanted and they can interact how they wanted to a much more closed society where unless you're part of the ceremony or event or you need to be there, you weren't able to get there. So a real social isolation that seems to happen by that seems to come to be by AD 13 or by 1300 CE. So as I was saying, there's the, these the, the pre-classic classic transition in the beginning of the Savano phase, 
the Holocom Society experienced life altering changes. You're going from this, like I said, open pit house village type of setup and some smaller settlement types and ball courts to walled compounds and walled uh, platform mounds. So the question has always been, why did this happen? There ha there's no real good evidence why you have this shift toward isolation and social segregation that goes on during the Hong Kong classic period. So for my dissertation, I wondered, could irrigation have been a possible driver toward this isolation or this change? Perplexing to archaeologists was an apparent disconnect between Hohokam society and irrigation. As you can see here, this is Jerry Howard's reconstruction from the 1990 or late 80s, early 90s of Canal System 2 going from the pioneer period, colonial, sedentary, and classic period. The assumption that the longstanding assumption for the Hohokam irrigation is that Hohokam society and Hohokam irrigation are linked. So anything that happens within Hohokam society happens in irrigation and vice versa. So if anything that happens in irrigation happens in society. So based off of reconstruction here and reconstruction south of the river and some other areas along the lower salt, there didn't seem to be correlation or they, they didn't seem to be doing the same thing. Society seemed to be doing one thing while irrigation seemed to be doing another, where you have growth of canal system two through time with sedentary or pre-classic right here going into the classic period. So there's real no, no real change other than growth going into the classic period. One thing that Jerry Howard suggested based off of his reconstruction of irrigation in the Lower Salt River Valley is that water may have become more scarce. More people were more, there were more farmers, more land to irrigate. And the, the amount of water available fluctuated through time and may have been at the point that there's more irrigated or more land to irrigate than there was water. So he suggested that a lack of water or water insufficiency may have caused the transition, the, the pre-classic classic transition and going into the Savannah phase. For my dissertation research, I set out to tackle this conundrum. I wanted to know why the, the histories of Hohokam society and irrigation differed in the valley. I just wanted to know, was there something going on between irrigation and the social transitions? So to do this, I set out to reconstruct the largest of the irrigation systems along the lower salt, Canal System 1, which is outlined in red here. Right, when I was formulating, deciding to do this irrigation, Hohokam irrigation as my dissertation topic, Jerry Howard was out here at the Riverview area, which is where the Cubs stadium is, the Cubs spring training stadium is now. And based off of his observations of canals of Canal System 1, going from its origin area out to the rest of the field areas, he concluded that there was a constriction right at that Riverview point where all the canals within Canal System 1 should have passed through there. So the thought was, if we could document all the canals there, they would give us dates for the entire system and we could see how the system grew through time. This shows kind of the, the overview of how Jerry uh, approached this linkage analysis. Each one of these stars is a different project area. Even though they're different project areas, he's able to reasonably suggest that each canal, each one of these segments or each one of these cross sections was the same canal. In this case, Canal Grand, Grande. So I intended to do that for my dissertation with Canal System 1 beginning with the Riverview system. But as it turned out, the number of projects I needed just weren't there south of the river. Unlike north of the river, north of the river, there's been many, many federal road projects giving us a unprecedented view of irrigation there, which we just don't have south of the river. So I had to change my methodology or what I really wanted to do. So instead, I focused I found a series or I was told of a series of historic aerial photographs from the flood control district of Maricopa County that seemed to have canals in them. And so by review, reviewing that database, I saw that 
there were a number of years from 1930 to present that would give me an indication of buried canals. So you can kind of see here, this is from 1959, north of the river. Each one of these dark little lines is a buried canal. It has to do with water not being able to absorb through the canal themselves. There's clays and other materials that are stopping percolation. With clays, they hold on to water better. So these areas are slightly drier than these areas. So you see these linear lines in the historic, especially the black and white photographs. So with the black and white photographs, previous maps and the available arche uh, archeological excavation areas or projects, I was able to build a master irrigation map for south of the river. But as it happens with dissertations, it soon be it soon became clear that things were not going to work out the way I thought it was going to work out, where instead of reconstructing a history for Canal System 1, a much more complex and nuanced picture of Pocom irrigation emerged. This image is over an area south of the, uh, the Lower Salt River, so the Salt River is right here. When I, when I looked at the, uh, the historic aerial photographs, I noticed that there was a break where canals from the upper part of Canal System 1 seemed to stop right around this red line. And then canals west of this, or to the left of this red line, seemed to all start to the, to the left of it. I looked at every aerial photograph, and there's not really projects in this area. But based off of all the information I could find, it appeared that the what should have been one complete system with these canals connecting up with these canals, one continuous canal or multiple con continuous canals. It looked like canal system was not canal system one was not one gigantic system, but actually four. My work revealed developmental histories for the Chrisman, which is here. Uh, or sorry, yeah. For the Chrisman, Sedimento, Riverview, and Los Mortos systems. As I was going through this, I thought I could use previous the, the previous irrigated acreage that Jerry Howard had provided for the Lower Salt River Valley for the, the amount of water demand part of the water supply and demand for water insufficiency or sufficiency. As it turned out, the complexity I saw within these systems showed me that I needed to reconstruct the other system, the, the other major systems along the Lower Salt River. So because of that, I, re, I provided, or I did reconstructions of the Coyote system, Scottsdale system, Lehigh system, and Canal system too. With this, I got a completely different, or a similar, but a very different view of HOCOM irrigation through time than previous models that Jerry Howard and others had provided for the Lower Salt River Valley. So now I'll, I'll briefly go, or I'll go through the irrigation along the Lower Salt River through time. So during the pioneer period from approximately uh, 475 to 750 CE, irrigation along the Lower Salt River began with four or five irrigation systems, the Coyote system, the Chrisman system, which as you can see here, that there's a distance between these two canals. So this might've been two con different canal systems, the Sedimento system and Canal System 2. Sometime around 700 CE, Canal System 2 actually left the floodplain. So here's a floodplain and went on to the Mesa Terrace. So you have the Mesa Terrace here and you have the Lehigh Terrace here, and Lehigh Terrace, Mesa Terrace here. Same thing, Lehigh Terrace, Mesa Terrace here. The Lehigh Terrace is part of the geologic Lower Salt River floodplain. So it still floods, unlike the Mesa Terrace. So the Canal System 2 was configured with its head gates so that canals could not just go onto the Lehigh Terrace, but up onto the Mesa Terrace. Interestingly enough, this is Los Ornos down here, and this is La Plaza where ASU is. Based off my reconstruction of the Sedimento system, it doesn't appear that the canal reached out to La Plaza or 
Los Hornos. Instead, we know that there was terracing going on of this part of South Mountain. So people living here may have been utilizing terracing instead of canal irrigation for their subsistence or ru water runoff and other means of agriculture. At La Plaza, you may have been, they may have practiced flood irrigation along the river banks rather than also rather than canal irrigation. So it's not really clear what's going on with Los Hornos and La Plaza, but the evidence is pointing to that they may not have been participating in this irrigation system yet. The colonial period was a time of agricultural growth along the river. The Eastern Crisman system, which is here, was reconstructed and extended out to Mesa Grande here. The Sedimento system here branched and extended out toward La Plaza and Los Hornos. The initial version of this, the Scottsdale system was constructed onto the Lehigh Terrace and essentially the floodplain. It was fairly short. And Canal System 2 unexpectedly reached its maximum north south extent during the colonial period. Before Jerry Howard's work, people thought that Hohokam irrigation grew accretionally, where canals were extended over time. So you'd have something small like this, and eventually it'd become very, very big. What he found is canals were completely reconstructed over time, and Canal System 2 in particular grew to its largest extent from north to south during the colonial. You do still get growth. You get more agricultural fields and agricultural areas growth kind of in the middle here through the but that was through the construction of new canals in this area. So the, the north-south extent of Canal System 2 is set at this time. Other systems are not the same way. The development of Hohokam irrigation along the Lower Salt was not without dramatic events. The excavations south of Lower Salt indicate that an extremely large flood likely took place sometime between the end of the colonial and the beginning of the sedentary period. As sh shown here, the dark gray areas, uh, dark gray shading represents the lateral extent of the 1891 flood, which is the largest flood documented historically. The peak flow of the 1891 flood was 300 cubic feet per second. This image right here was taken shortly before the floodwaters destroyed the Tempe Railroad Bridge. So if you, you heard news of a, tra a train derailment that was carrying chemicals, and they had to blow up part of the, the bridge, that's this bridge this year. So you can see here's the water here, and this is debris that's been washing down the river itself. So you can see, also you see that the railroad bridge or the, the span is buckling under the, the weight of the water and the, the speed of the water. The image on the right, is of the bridge in 1989. This bridge, this part of the bridge was constructed in 1912 after a series of floods. This gives you a scale of the flood itself. This is off to the side of the flood, so it's actually deeper out here. This is where Tempe Town Lake is now. But this span right here is 12 feet. So it gives you an idea of how much the river really swelled during the 1891 flood. Flooding is a common occurrence for both prehistorically and historically. Before dams like Roosevelt Dam and others within the Salt River headwaters, you'd have floods about every year. Annual floods were approximately 8,000 to 12,000 cubic feet per second, which would have destroyed the, the type of dams that they had, that the Hohokam and a lot of early historic dams were, and ripped out head gates you really don't see head gates not getting damaged until you have concrete head gates. They had, like I said, they had had several of these floods before. And the previous year, they had a pretty large flood, not 300,000 cubic feet per second, but still quite large. The, on the morning of February 19th, I believe, in 1891, it, the the flood really crests very, very quickly, much quicker, more quickly than people expected and much wider than people expected to the extent that school was being held. So students within the original primary school in Phoenix were trapped in the upper story of the school. And that's two to three miles 
So the lateral extent of the 1891 flood was two to three miles. People that lived along the floodplain were trapped on top of their, the roofs of their houses and had to wait for people with the few boats in the area to come and rescue them. So this was a very impactful flood and this extended way beyond the floodplain or way beyond the river itself. Along with that, at 300 cubic feet per second, it destroyed canals, it actually ripped them up because at the time they were still using earthen canals. So portions of the canal bed were ripped up by the turbulence of the floodwaters. And you can actually see that within canal profiles, not necessarily the 1891 flood, but floods that happened before then within prehistoric canals, you can see that. So returning to the map with the 1891 flood extent and the sedimento system, the late colonial to early uh, sedentary, extremely large flood had deposits documented further away from the river as marked by the red star and dotted line. It was estimated that the peak flow of the extremely large flood may have been as much as 400,000 to 450,000 cubic feet per second, so a magnitude larger. After the flood, after the, the extremely large flood, there appears to have been a fundamental reorganization and massive expansion of irrigation in the valley. During the colonial period, as I showed, except for canal system two and the beginning expansion of sedimento system, Hohokam irrigation was pretty small, a single canal, a single main canal, or uh, not very long. After this point, it looks, and as I'll, you'll see with the sedentary period, the length, the extent and complexity of Hohokam irrigation along the lower salt intensifies greatly. So in, in essence, this very, very destructive event led to a rebirth of irrigation along the Lower Salt River for the, the Hohokam. The sedentary period saw a growth, saw growth of the Coyote system, the Chrisman system here. So no longer do you have individual main canals. You have a really interconnected system, an actual system. Uh, and canal system too, possibly because of the, the extent of damage caused by the extremely large flood, the rear view system replaced the sedimento system and the Scottsdale system moved off of the floodplain and onto the Mesa Terrace. There's a few, there, there does seem to be fields on the uh, Lehigh Terrace, but by and large, the Scottsdale system was on the Mesa Terrace. With that, you have the movement of those intake areas. So originally the Scottsdale system intake area was here and it gets moved several miles up river. With the Riverview system, the Sedimento intake was here. It's moved all the way down to now where the Cub Spring training facility is. Finally, you have the construction of the Lehigh system or the founding of the Lehigh system. This system is extremely interesting because you can actually see it sits above the river. So this is a Mesa Terrace. These are on, this is on the Mesa Terrace and this is on the Mesa Terrace, but you can't actually see it on, from the ground. Here, if you are here, you're looking up a hill. And so there's always been the question of how did they bring water onto this upper terrace or how they bring water up? Because without pumps, water doesn't flow uphill. During my research and looking at elevations uh, across the valley, I found a point more or less right here, where the Lehigh Terrace and the Mesa Terrace seem to have met. So it seems like the Hohokam brought a main canal through this area and then they're able to bring and irrigate the land that became the Lehigh system. In the 1970s, Robert Herskovitz was the first to use aerial photographs to identify in ground truth Hohokam canals during the US 60 freeway project south of the Lower Salt. A few years later, Bruce Massey characterized the network of canals seen here in the aerials as a spider web like network of canals. This image right here is from Massey's article from 1981. And you can see these are the, the photographs that Herskovitz originally obtained. You can see the little how these are interconnected and how he got the idea of or gave the analogy of a spider web. Although this is an important discovery, it was largely underappreciated and confined to the project area. 
Jerry Howard talks about it later on in his dissertation, but the the standard model of Hohokam irrigation largely doesn't change despite this. My review of the historic aerial photographs, which is, this is another area from 1949, indicated that, revealed that the networks that Massey and others, or Massey had identified is seen across the valley. This prompted me to term the, this network of canals standard irrigation units. And I'll show a, a stylized model of it in the, on the next slide. Image C here is from our SIU fields that were documented at this, during the Fi Phoenix SkyTrain project next to Sky Harbor International Airport in Pueblo Grande. This actually, this is one of the few instances that we actually do have on the ground documentation of the standard irrigation units, where you have larger canals that are feeding primary laterals that seem to be bringing out to secondary laterals and then out to fields. And you, like this image is showing, you see this across the valley. The dates that they got for this was approximately 1000 to 1100 CE using optically, optically stimulated luminescence. Uh, yeah. And then image D is part of the field system that was documented at Los, the site of Las Capas, which is an early agricultural site in Tucson. Although the, yeah, although thousands of years earlier than the SkyTrain fields here, so this dates to about 1200 BC or BCE, the same basic design is seen in the two areas. So you can see there's larger canals here. You have primary laterals, secondary laterals going out to fields. This is a much smaller field network than you have along the lower Salt River, but it's at least showing that this idea is not new. It's not being stuck, or it's not just along the lower Salt River, but it seems to have been in, in the area of Tucson dating it or predating it by a thousand years or so. So this is a, a hypothesized or a theorized model of the standard irrigation unit. Like I was saying, you have a main canal here. This canal bifurcates or splits into branches, primary lateral, secondary lateral, then field turnouts to fields. Within the previous model that Jerry Howard and others had proposed for Hohokam irrigation, you only had this main canal you had branch canal here, and the fields were only on the downslope side. So you're extremely limited where you could actually expand to and where irrigation could actually be. The standard irrigation units seem to be much more conducive to both growth, so you can just continue adding on as long as you have enough water pressure, new fields through bifurcation of this canal. And if water is used here, you use all your water here, you can pass on any additional water you can pass on to the next area. So it's here, you can go back into this primary lateral, then back out to the bifurcated canal, can come here, come in here, can come back out. Within the standard model, you have the main canal, branch canal. And once it's in the branch canal, that water has to be used within the fields or it's lost through evaporation or seepage. So this seems to be a much more efficient uh, way of irrigating than the previous model suggested. So although uh, we, we don't have canals predating 1,100 CE, the antiquity of the Las Capas fields indicates, and the ubiquity of these standard irrigation units across the valley indicate that standard irrigation units were possibly in use along the Lower Salt River before the large, extremely large flood. So I'm just, I'm, I know there's been a few other areas that this type of field system has been found along the Lower Salt River. So until we find much older versions of this, tentatively the SIUs are dated to the beginning of the sedentary period or around, or at, yeah, or around 950, 900 to 1000. Most of the irrigation systems may have reached their full agricultural extent during the early classic. So from 1100 slash 1150 to 1300. The noble event of the early classic was the establishment of the Los Mortos system. The system that's shown here, which is here, during this time, the Los Mortos system was probably not looking like this. It was not this uh, extensive or complex. It's probably a much 
fewer canals, the data that I was that was available to me just didn't allow me to differentiate or to separate early classic from late classic system. So that's why this looks like this. Given the little bit we know about the early Los Mortos settlement, it was likely no more than a hamlet. So the village that, so that Los Mortos village is down here. So this area, the part that the Hemingway expedition excavated largely dated to the, the late classic. There is some earlier stuff there, but the, the compounds and platform mound at Los Mortos, those are all date to like late classic. So not much is going on here. So this is likely a less service. There's less system than here. The extent of irrigation may have changed during the late classic, like I was discussing with Los Mortos system, but I simply just can't see it with the data that was available to me. The exception is the Lehigh system seems to have been abandoned or fell out of use. Habitation away from the Mesa Terrace edge, so that's right here, seems to have ceased. I, I wasn't able to find any sites out here that date to this time, the late classic period. So it looks like people just weren't living out here. So mostly along this edge. Further, the intake for the Los Mortos system, which is here, neighbors where the Los, the Lehigh system head gates or the intake area was here. This is very, very important because even though Los Mortos system was the last system that was established along the Lower Salt River, it has one of the first places where water is taken off. And as you can see here, this is a lot of land being irrigated. So it's within irrigation studies, the assumption is if you're able to establish a head gate above or before everybody else, that means you probably have pre-appropriation rights or that people know that you're there for a long time. So with this settlement pattern, without with settlements not really being here and that this being so large and so late and with its head gates, it's possible that people that formerly lived in the Lehigh system moved over to the rapidly growing Los Morto system which grew at a rate that was beyond a birth rate. It really seems like people from the area were coming here and joining Los Mortos and maybe as far south as the middle Gila River. So at, as time approached the end of the Hohokam cultural sequence, irrigation systems along the Lower Salt River appeared to decline at different rates. So there was no collapse along the Lower Salt River. These systems seem to have gone on and stopped being used at different times data such as ceramics and other thing, other data seem to indicate that Los Mortos system may have been one of the last ones in operation, considering it's also one of the first to take off the river. Um, so returning now to the water sufficiency analysis, did they have, did, was a water deficit, long-term water deficit causing, did it cause the social changes that I discussed? So supply and demand, the amount of water needed to successfully grow agricultural crops is largely unknown. Studies of traditional maize have shown that at least some portion of fields will reach maturity with a single application of water. This type of parameters is simply just not known for other ancient crops, at least within the Southwest and among the Hohokam. Maize therefore has become, or has, is used as a Hohokam agricultural proxy by scholars. A range of depths from one to four acre feet, an acre foot is the amount of feet of water that's placed on a field, have been suggested to be necessary for su successful harvests or yields. Reason being is, it's, if you don't have enough water to flush the root zone, it's believed that salts will build up and essentially kill your plants. So you have to have a lot of water that continually flushes down these salts. So it's from one to acre feet, one to four acre feet may have it has been suggested to be necessary to flush those salts. Using the amount of available water during key points in the maize growth cycle through time, based on previous Salt River annual stream flow reconstructions, the amount of available agricultural land for each system, which is agricultural demand, and the range of water depths, which I just mentioned, identified the number of years each system received less than its full requirement of water or did not have water sufficiency. So as you can see here, I ended up having a range of acreages based off of standard, the standard irrigation method where 
only where the these SIUs seem to be were where the fields were. So large areas were not irrigated based off this model. It's only particular areas that have these primary, secondary, and so forth. So that ended up being the lower end of my acreage range. This is the buffer method, which was developed by Kyle Woodson on the Mill Gila River, which included data uh, from the Lower Salt River, where it's thought, at least ethnographically, we know along the Mill Gila that people were irrigating on both sides of canals when possible if the gradient wasn't too great or you didn't have a, a mountain or a hill or a village or anything else. So the, the assumption was that within a certain extent from the canal on both sides, you could irrigate that land. So this became my range to figure out not only did they have enough water, but approximately how much water did they have? How much land could they actually irrigate based off of the amount that they're expecting and the amount of water they, they had? Traditional irrigation societies also are known to have food stores. So it also looked at multi-year deficits. And as it turned out, the multi-year deficits provided much more insight than the single year deficits. The multi-year deficit revealed that most of the irrigation systems were receiving an adequate amount of water between the SIU and the buffer acreage amounts for two acre feet or less for much of the time. The exception of this was canal system two and the river view system. The river view system uh, had some issues during the early classic period, but the canal system two seemed to have long-term issues throughout time. Canal system two, so you have the other irrigation systems, at least within the major irrigation systems, canal system two was positioned as last in line of the major irrigation systems to get water. And based off the amount of acreage that was irrigated, in this part of the valley, there was times when no surface water was reaching canal system two. So the thought was during the early classic period. So if that were true, then canal system two so should have essentially collapsed during the, sometime during the early classic. We know that's not true because there's several large platform mound villages like Pueblo Grande and uh, Las Colinas within canal system two. So some, something was bringing water when there wasn't water on the surface, at least from the surface flow along the river itself. When I looked at the subsurface geology, which is represented here, this is all sediment, sediment this darker gray is uh, basin fill or valley fill in the water table right here. At the head gates or the intake of Canal System 2 is the only bedrock reef within the valley between Granite Reef Dam here and Papago and Tempe Butte. So when water reached this bedrock reef, it was forced to resurface. This water table is forced to resurface, providing water at the head gates or the intake of Canal System 2. Essentially, they, Canal System 2 had, was, had water that wasn't available to anybody else. There's not records of the amount of water that was percolating up at this point, but it, based off the size of the villages within Canal System 2 during the Glade Classic, it's likely that is quite a bit to support platform mounds and other things that was not possible without that bedrock reef. Given the results of my research, I concluded that water deficits likely did not prompt the two major cultural transitions. It just did not seem that there was enough, water deficits were occurring long-term enough or, or persistent enough to really cause a shift toward people not trusting each other and more isolated. So, out, so whatever caused the, the pre-classic classic transition, so the collapse of the ball course in the marketplace system and the beginning of the Savano, so the standard use of walled compounds wasn't related, directly related to the irrigation systems. This shouldn't be that surpri surprising because the Hocom region was much larger than the Lower Salt River Valley or even the Phoenix Basin. So it was likely a multitude of factors beyond irrigation that caused these tr transitions. So during my postdoc here at Archaeology Southwest, I've been exploring the relationship between irrigation management and political control. The assumption is that political elites later in time stationed at platform mounds were controlling the system. But my review of the Hocom architecture or archaeological record and wider irrigation literature has led me to the conclusion, and this is, I'm still 
working through this. This is an ongoing process, but I have a tentative conclusion that the irrigation realm and the social political realm, so larger Hohokam society, were different realms. Yes, yeah, so you had irrigators that were in both Hohokam society and irrigators, but the irrigation systems themselves were self-contained, self-managed by the farmers themselves, which allowed them to persist through time through these major events like the pre-classic classic transition and the Savano. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chris. Lots of good stuff there. Thank you very much. Um, like um, like Chris's um, slide shows right now, um, you know, for more information, and we'll, we'll try to post some more information, maybe answer some more questions at this uh, web address. But I'm going to throw a few questions at you, Chris. And we've had a few coming in um, throughout the, throughout the, um, the thing. Uh, first of all, Bruce Hilpert just says clap, clap. So you, you got a, you had a, you had a good clap there. Um, let's see. Um, so Barbara Mills, first of all, she says, thank you, Chris, for your insights on the extreme flooding events. How do extreme drought events also factor into the timing of social changes during the important transitions that you've pointed out? Any insights about droughts, the other, other side? Yeah, so the, based on uh, Donald Graybill's reconstruction of the dendroclimatic models are looking at how precipitation within the Salt River headwaters affected the growth of ponderosa pines and other trees, sensitive trees. There were points where there was low flows. And so there wasn't, there. And I, I was capturing that with the wire deficits. So that was being picked up, which systems were getting water, which systems weren't. And as I was saying, during the late classic period or early classic period, based on the amount of water and the amount of systems, it seems like Canal System 2 wasn't receiving surface water except for the Bedrock Reef or because of the Bedrock Reef. So it's at least within the environment of the upper or the salt river headwaters there was no at least perceivable long-term drought that pre stopped hocom along the lower salt river from getting water um, enough water to support first the ball court system and ball courts and large villages during the pre-classic and then the eventual much fewer large villages during the late classic, but you have platform mounds and a number of other things. So you just don't really see the out migration that you expect for a large drought since it's the collection with the Salt River, it's a collection of all the headwaters. So it seems like there was enough water coming there. And just, I, I just haven't seen anything or people really discuss what droughts may have been going on at that time. Um. So in terms of your conclusions, um, how widely to the Southwest or beyond do you think that your conclusions could apply? Wh which ones? The, <laughs> the, regarding the... The standard irrigation units yeah. or... Well, your conclusions is the Yeah, question. so the standard <laughs> irrigation units, I've exchanged correspondence with Robert Hunt, who is an expert in traditional irrigation societies he's never seen anything quite like this it's something like it's this is it's happening so we have this along the lower salt river at the sky train and you have it in tucson at las capas and some other areas so it's, it's happening in the, the lower salt river valley or in in, in the hocom region i mean the las capas is predating hocom but in the in the region you just don't see that type of interconnection at least that i'm aware of elsewhere around the world so he, he said it's he hadn't seen it, but it's plausible. Hmm. Um, the fact that the irrigation systems are persisting through these major disruptions, that doesn't surprise me, based off of a lot of ethnographic and theory work that's been done by Eleanor Ulstrom and some other scholars that says farmers are really um, in instrumental to the persistence of irrigation systems. Okay. 
All right, let's see. Um, I'm looking through questions here. <laughs> um, well, there's been a couple of questions. I'm wondering if you could just really briefly, and this is like a really basic kind of help some folk understand Hoacom archeological terms. Um, yeah. Because there's been a question about when did the term Savano be, get to be used? There's been a, some questions about what does colonial period mean? Does that mean somebody was colonizing the place? I mean, can, can, you, can you just give our listeners a real quick kind of like how the heck did archaeologists end up using these kinds of terms? Um, yeah, so Savano, like I'm not as up on where that actually came from. The... I'll defer on that. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> but when the the Holocom chronology was being developed, it was a very neo-evolutionary approach where you had people, you had pioneers coming into an area. Then you, they colonize the area. They set they settle down and become sedentary. And then you have the classic period. So if you actually, if you think about classic Maya, you have pre-classic Maya, than classic Maya, which is supposed to be the fluorescence of uh, culture and other things going on. So that's that's kind of the idea. It's this progression from pioneers to an area up to a cultural fluorescence. And to clarify, that's not really how we think about all of this stuff anymore, but it's that's just historically kind of how, how those researchers or scientists we're putting things, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that helps. So here's a question, um, I will read it. So it seems that there was a high flow event that reshaped the morphology of the river and flood plain sedimentation that led to threshold events that forced the change in irrigation practice instead of a lowered river due to drought. Is this a fair conclusion? And then drought may have then occurred on top of changes in irrigation distribution and caused more stress. Well, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So was there a really big flood and followed by a bunch of uh, drought, essentially? So how I'm interpreting it. I I'd say no, because right after the extremely large flood and the reshaping of irrigation, you have a fluorescence of Ho the Hocom region. So that after that event is when you have the ball court and the marketplace, far reaching marketplace system. So within the way it's been conceptualized by Dave Abbott, the marketplace system is far reaching. You have pots coming up, red on buff pots being produced along the middle Gila River, possibly materials um, like large body mammals, rams, sheep and other large mammals in the upland area so in uh, the anthem in arizona anthem area or cave creek area and then you have possibly agricultural production going on along the lower salt river so you have maize for sheep for pots going on if it if there was some kind of persistent drought going on after that extremely large flood then yeah, I just, you wouldn't, I don't think you'd have the marketplace system or the ball court system that you do during the sedentary period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a danger having me ask these questions because I don't know enough necessarily to know whether some of these things are like, oh my God, this is tough or easy. But um, I'm gonna throw this one out at you. It says, right. nice, nice presentation, Chris. You have now expanded canal system one from one system to at least four to five systems. Yeah. How does this change your impression of how the managers of these systems had to interact? Is this Dave? No, oh, it's no, Kyle. Okay. <laughs> Very Dave question. It's, uh, a, it's Kyle, so. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle. Hi, <Wilson>. Kyle. <laughs> yeah, so I, it's, with Canal System 1 being so large, it would have taken a huge amount of administration to, to manage that. Whereas by breaking it up into four systems that are actually more complex than the way Jerry Howard had conceptualized irrigation with the main canal, branch canal, and going out to fields. It's 
more complex at the level of the farmer, but the system itself is smaller. So the number of people that are interacting within the irrigation system, they're less. So your, your irrigation collective is much smaller, um, I guess less unruly than the canal system one. Now, making sure that you get your water when you need it with how interconnected these, the standard irrigation units seem to be, that's, that's a feat in itself, but um, mm -hmm. both less complex and more complex, I guess. Just a quickie, there were a couple of questions. I think you'd mentioned this, that a lot of the um, uh, canals in modern Phoenix are basically following um, the, 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 Hoacom canals. That's correct. I, I just yes. want to clarify that that is indeed correct. Um, somebody was asking um, the freeways in that valley don't have any kind of connection with the canal systems that you know about, do you? The major pathways, the major routes through the valley? No, just no, they don't. I mean, the if it weren't for the freeways, we wouldn't know a lot about <laughs> the canals themselves. But right. they're they're not. The canals are not running along the canal right. or the. Freeways are not running along the canals. The canals allow, or the freeways allow us to get these cross-sectional cuts through trenching to view the pre, the Hohokam canals and let us document and date them. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got a few more questions, but it is you know after seven, and I try to keep this to more or less an hour or so. But I'll let everybody know um, uh, we have all the questions, and we will share them with Chris tomorrow and. Um, ask him if he can um, come up with some answers to most of those. And we'll post that on our, our website at the address that you see. So um, you can get a lot more information from our website in a couple of days. We'll follow up and let you know about that um, as well. So um, Bill, did you want to come back at all? Say goodbye to everybody. <laughs> there I be. Um, so just want to thank Chris for an excellent presentation and for you know providing these new insights into uh, some canal systems that have been studied for a long period of time. So thank you for your effort there. And want to remind everybody that this is a monthly event. We'll be back on the first Tuesday of uh, December. And that happens to actually be on December 1st. So it's, uh, we're going to get rid of 2020 here relatively <laughs> soon, it appears. So, um, but our speakers, uh, Shannon Cowell, a relatively new um, employee working with our uh, cooperative program with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, and her master's um, uh, professor from New Mexico State University, Kelly Jenks, will be presenting a talk on beloved things, micaceous bean pots, and connections to the Hispanic New Mexican homeland. So I've read uh, the, district, the uh, master's thesis and it's excellent. And Shannon, and uh, I look forward to actually meeting Kelly. So please join us uh, a month from now on the first day of December. And again, we'll be back very soon with uh, more information on the URL that you can see there today, but uh, we'll let you go have a late dinner or finish that beer that you opened up a while ago. and. Uh, have a great night, everyone.